Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Neil Kalin. Welcome to our Legal Live webinar on the residential listing agreement and related forms. Yes, we're supposed to start at 10 a.m., but we had over 3,000 people registered, and we know a lot of people sign on exactly at 10 a.m. So we're going to give people just another couple of minutes, then we'll get started. I'm going to explain how we're going to approach today's webinar because we have a lot of material to get through. And if past experience is any indication of, to, of what's gonna to happen today, we're gonna to allow time for questions and answers in addition to our allotted slot from 10 to 11. So just give me another two minutes and I will get started no matter how many people we have, whether it's a lot or whether it's a little. Thank you very much. Be right back with you. I'm spending these few minutes looking at the Q&A tab because once this seminar gets started, I don't have any chance to look at it and see what's going on. So it's always nice for me to get some idea as to the kind of questions people are asking bright and early. Well, it's 10.02. I want to get us started. Welcome to the Legal Live webinar. I'm going to be your host today. My name is Neil Kalin. As you can see from the screen, uh, oh, it doesn't say on the screen, but I am the Assistant General Counsel at CAR, and I am one of the legal advisors to CAR's Standard Forms Advisory Committee. On the screen, it says that Justin Murakawa is going to join me, but because we have so many people, Justin's going to be in the background today answering questions along with Jenna Gardner and Amanda Gunn. So we're very happy to have all three of them helping out. Let me tell you just briefly what our routine is going to be today. I'm going to be talking pretty much straight through for probably maybe 50 minutes to an hour. And then we're going to stay late. Um, the three attorneys that are answering questions will then present to me the most common questions that they've received. And I'm going to be answering questions for another half an hour. So really, we're going to be going to 1130. If you're able to join us to listen to the Q&A part, happy to have you. If you cannot stay beyond 11, at least you will hear the main portion of the program. A couple of other items that I think you want to be aware of. There is a chat tab, and the chat tab has been disabled for all of you in terms of submitting information, but staff will be posting items on the chat, giving you links to relevant documents or relevant URLs, things that we think you need to know. The Q&A tab is open. Justin, Amanda, and Jana are going to be doing their best to answer as many questions as possible, but you far outnumber them. So please don't, in, don't anticipate that every question that is asked is going to be answered. But again, I will be addressing the most common questions um, at the end of the webinar. Let's see, anything else? Yes, something else, which is, have to give this warning that we are very concerned about antitrust issues at CIR. So if you post questions um, and you are making reference to commission amounts or dollar amounts, please refrain from doing that, right? There is no standard amounts that can be used. So we appreciate if you would stay away from from mentioning specific dollar or percentage amounts. 
because we don't want to have any indication that CAR is authorizing or approving certain amounts for compensation from principals to their brokers. Okay, that's great. Perfect. Let me get started now. I think got just a, as we always do at our Legal Live webinars, we have a couple of announcements. So we've got some more webinars coming up next week on June 11. Justin and I, Justin will be in the front next week. We're going to be talking about all of the other new and revised forms at CAR. So for the, really for the, the June release, we had, I think, a total of 72 forms. Four were released in March. One was released in May. That brings us down to 67. Then we've got several forms dealing with the residential listing agreement, several forms dealing with the buyer representation agreement. So we had a webinar on the buyer representation agreement yesterday. If you did not see that webinar and you're interested in learning more about buyer representation agreements, well, you can go to car.org, Risk Management Live, and you can see a copy of that webinar from yesterday. But after we get rid of all of those forms dealing with compensation, there's still well over, there's still around 40 other forms. Justin and I are going to be highlighting the most relevant changes to those forms next week on June 11. And I want to remind everybody, we've got a great webinar in June, excuse me, in July 11, it's escaping the forms issue entirely. We're going to deal with abusive clients and agents. So something to look forward to in July, get a little break from standard forms. We've had quick guides came out last month's quick guide was be careful what you write and say, it might come back to you someday. And I am a good example of that because when I first drafted the title to that quick guide for last month, it said, be careful what you write and say, it might bite you in the A and I was able to not release that right away, to take my time to see that, oh, that might be offensive to some people. So I was able to change it before actually putting it out there in print. So good advice there at that recent quick guide of watching yourself when you put something out that others can read. We got a brand new Legal Matters podcast. Jana, who's on the back today, as well as her partner, Dana, are talking about mid-year new laws, and that's going to be a nice complement to next week's form webinar because some of the new laws required us to change some of our forms. And don't forget our social media account. We have an Instagram account and we have an X account. Great announcements done. Let's get into the residential listing agreement. There's a lot of things here that are same old, same old, right? A lot of things that have not been changed. I'm not going to spend very much time talking about the things that have not been changed. I want to talk today about the things that have been changed. So there's a lot here that's new. You can see right here, there's going to be the listing agreement is going to have a grid format, just like we did for the RPA a few years ago. Listing agreement is going to have a grid format where all of the negotiable terms all of the terms that have fill-in fields are going to be right up front. So big difference in the way the listing agreement is going to look. New approach to compensation. That's really the crux of what we're going to be talking about. A new bundle order for the listing agreement. So the current listing agreement has a whole bunch of forms that are bundled with it that are right up front before you ever get to the listing agreement. You kind of have to weed through several pages before you get to the primary document. Well, starting in June, CAR is changing the way we do our bundle of forms. The only form that's going to be up front is the disclosure regarding real estate agency relationship, the AD form. Then you go right into the residential listing agreement. And then we have the other forms that are going to be bundled with it. What are examples of some of those forms? Well, we have a seller advisory. We have a broker compensation advisory. Well, I think for the listing agreement, we have the fair housing and discrimination advisory. We have the PRBS, potential representation of more than one buyer and seller. And then we have the 
consumer privacy form. I think our code for that is CCPA. And I'm sure if Justin's listening, he will put down the list of everything else that's going to be there. So a new bundle, we like that. It's going to be easier for you, easier for clients to see the core form that they are most interested in. But most of what's in the listing agreement really has not changed. We know you all use the listing agreement, so that's good news. There's going to be a lot that you do not have to become newly familiar with. So again, I'm going to be focusing on the differences today. Let's look here. So what's one thing that's new? Well, right above paragraph two, you see some bold language. It talks about the maximum listing period that is allowed. This is that's allowed under law. There is already a California law in effect that says the maximum listing period can be two years. I really don't think this affects many of you. We already have language like that in our listing agreement but it's now been made more prominent. It's, it's going to be made bold for the June release. And there's going to be an asterisk there. There's going to be another reference to it in paragraph 2A. We just want to make sure everybody is aware of that maximum amount that is set by law. Those of you who attended the buyer representation class know that we, ha we have a contractual and soon to be statutory maximum representation period for buyer representation that's three months why because the the bill that we anticipate becoming law shortly in california treats buyer representation periods differently from seller representation periods so that's all really the only difference there is what it's been made bold we've got that asterisk and we've got that second reminder of that of that period so Good thing to be aware of there. But when we look at paragraph two and we look at 2A, um, we have the listing price. You know, nothing different there. You're going to put a price in. 2A1, you're going to have a beginning date. You're going to have an ending date. You know that there's going to be a maximum there. I rarely see listings in the residential context that go that long anyway, so it should not be a problem for most of you. And then paragraph 2B, references something that's already in the existing listing agreement, which is CAR made the decision years ago, instead of having multiple listing agreements for different kinds of properties, when 95% of all that information was exactly the same, we created a listing addendum, one for manufactured homes, for mobile homes, and one for probate properties, which could be a probate, a conservatorship, a guardianship, um, or even a receivership for that matter. So if you have one of those specialized properties that's being listed, you'll check the box. Here we go, though, now into paragraph 2C of the grid, still on the first page of the new listing agreement. You know, something I forgot to mention, this listing agreement is being released in June of this year, so June of 2024. The scheduled release date is June 25. June 25 is the scheduled release date for our new residential listing agreement and indeed all of the other listing agreements that are going to conform so that you have consistency among CAR forms. All right, so now let's look back at paragraph 2C of the June version of the residential listing agreement. We're talking about compensation. That's the big issue. There are a lot of changes that are necessitated by the NAR nationwide settlement of a class action lawsuit that's going to mandate certain changes in the way brokers address compensation with their clients. So I'm going to go through some of these in more detail later, later but just quickly to start, C1. Notice it says compensation to seller's broker only seller side of the transaction. Very important. Probably what most of you are used to is that the seller authorizes or, or the seller agrees to pay compensation to the listing broker, to the seller's broker, and the seller's broker takes some of that pot of money and says, I'm going to offer to cooperate or share some of that with the buyer side agent, right? So there's one set amount that is agreed to in the listing agreement. No more. We're not going to follow that process anymore. Instead, C1 
only addresses the seller side of the transaction. If the seller and the listing agent talk about it and say, you know what, we think to market your seller, the property seller, you should authorize me as your broker, as a listing broker, to cooperate with the buyer's broker, then that is the possibility in paragraph C2. Notice it is optional. A box would have to be checked and a separate amount would have to be filled in to the far right column in paragraph C2. The seller can just say, no, I'm only agreeing to pay you, my broker, and we're gonna put an amount in there. That's between the seller and the listing broker only. C2 will only be completed if the seller agrees that it is in the seller's best interest for the listing broker to offer uh, some compensation amount to the buyer side that is gonna be treated completely separately from C1. Different amounts, no single amount, those amounts are going to be treated separately. I'm gonna talk more about that later. And then there's the possibility where maybe the buyer is unrepresented. I'm gonna get into all of those issues later, but just wanted to point out the big differences in compensation. So let's look at those a little bit more fully right now. So the very beginning of C, paragraph 2C, talks about compensation as negotiable. This has been a clause that has been in CAR standard forms for many years. It is required by law already in California, and it is also mandated by the NAR settlement. That was not a big deal for us. We already had language in our contract that did that. But notice that top yellow highlight in the gray box says C attached broker compensation advisor. That's one of the forms that's gonna be bundled with the residential listing agreement. I wanna talk about the broker compensation advisory right now. If you look at that form on your screen, you see a little red circle and it says the release date is five of 24. That's May of 2024. That means the broker compensation advisory is already out in the field. Our standard forms committee said, it is so important for agents to start having the discussion about how compensation works with their clients that we wanted to get this form out in the field even before the listing agreement was released, even before our buyer representation agreements, our new buyer representation agreements were released because we want agents to get used to having that discussion with their clients. So if we look at this form, the broker compensation advisory, paragraph one is really addressing seller issues. So when sellers list their property, they agree to pay the seller's broker compensation, right? That was our paragraph 2C1. Again, another reminder, the amount is negotiable. They are not fixed by law. I think we should all be well aware of that by now. And if you weren't, the fact that we've repeated three times should make you aware of it right away. But paragraph one of the broker compensation advisory, paragraph 1B talks about, wait a minute, offering compensation to the buyer's broker is negotiable, right? So here we're still having a conversation with the seller and we're talking about, should there be an offer of compensation to the buyer's broker? And paragraph 1B in the BCA form identifies why there might be very good reasons for the seller agree to agree to authorize the listing broker to cooperate with the buyer's broker. And those reasons can, you can see them, they're listed in 1B. Good example of them, just for the buyer to know, right? What their overall cost might be in the transaction could be very helpful to buyers writing an offer. The seller's property might be more attractive to buyers if they are aware of this in advance and they are aware that the seller's side agent could be helping pay the buyer's side agent, okay? So good reasons, more explanations in paragraph 1B, but just to make sure the offer of compensation from seller's broker to buyer's broker is optional. We wanna make sure that you as licensees have that discussion with your seller clients. Well, what about the rest of the broker compensation advisory? If I could get my slide to change, here we go. 
The rest of the broker compensation advisory, paragraphs two and three, talk about buyer side broker commissions. So many of you are thinking, well, I'm taking a listing. What do I care? Why should I care about that? The reason that you should care about that is you want to make sure your seller has an understanding of the way compensation is going to be working going forward with, with real estate transactions in California. Okay. And so buyers are going to be required, excuse me, buyers agents are going to be required to have a agreement, a representation agreement with their buyer. If they are working with a buyer and they show the buyer property or give a buyer a tour of a property, either in person or virtually, that is one of the terms of the NAR settlement that that type of representation agreement needs to be in place. There is no specific dollar amount or percentage amount that needs to be part of that buyer representation agreement, but there does need to be an agreement in place prior to showing property or giving a tour of property if you are working with a buyer. Paragraph three talks about the different ways a buyer's broker can be compensated. So 3A says buyer might pay their own broker. That could work out very well for people depending on their financial circumstances. But 3B says, wait a minute, seller can also agree to pay the buyer's broker. Here, when we're bringing this form up and you're taking a listing, you're probably only going to be concerned about 3B1. You're not going to be concerned about 3B2 because 3B2 says if seller is unrepresented. Here, you're going to be taking a listing, so the seller is going to be represented. So the only issue for you at this stage is maybe you have a discussion about 3B1, which is seller. The buyer could ask you as the seller to pay all or part of the obligation the buyer has to pay their own broker. So either the buyer is going to pay or maybe the seller is going to pay all or some of it. And then 3C, there is another way for the buyer's agent to be paid, which is the seller's agent can agree to cooperate or pay compensation to the buyer's agent. And that's what we are talking about in the RLA, the Residential Listing Agreement, paragraph 2C2. So any of those ways could be acceptable. The seller needs to be aware of them because the buyer, the buyer's agent, may have conversations with the seller's agents about ways to get compensation for the buyer's agent in the transaction. And it's good for your seller to be aware of that at the time of a listing. All right, so we're back to our RLA form. Again, paragraph C1, just to re-emphasize, this is only the seller side. That's the compensation only for the seller side of the transaction. 2C2, okay? 2C2 is the optional, right, authorization of the seller to tell the seller's broker, yes, I think it's a good idea for you to offer to cooperate with buyer's side agents. And it is separate from, and it would be in addition to whatever the seller is agreeing to pay in 3C1. Now, as it works out with the grid, we've got the main terms in the grid and always a reference to a substantive paragraph. In the case of optional additional compensation, it refers you to paragraph 4B. So I put 4B on the screen for you to see. The advisory, we already talked about. There's the broker compensation advisory. Hopefully you will have that form. Initiate that compensation discussion with your seller client. Also, you're gonna be telling the seller client something you need to know, seller, that once this NAR settlement gets implemented, and the scheduled date for that is August 17th of this year. So the forms are being released June of this year. The last implementation date from NAR is August 17th of this year, but it's possible that the MLS where you do business might implement policies earlier than August 17th. Okay? But once those policies get implemented, there will no longer be an offer of compensation 
through the multiple listing service. So seller, if you are <clears throat> authorizing compensation from the seller's agent to the buyer's agent, how can that offer of compensation be made? And I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, but it cannot be made through the MLS or through the MLS substitute. So I have a little graphic in the bottom of your screen just to help you think about things differently. I'm kind of a pictorial person myself. The old method is there was one carton of milk. The seller filled that carton of milk up and then the seller's agent can pour some, a little or a lot of that milk into the buyer's agent's glass. The new methodology, we're gonna have two cartons, one carton for the seller's agent, one carton for the buyer's agent, and for those of you who are not as Puritan as me, let's think about that differently. The old method, well, guess what? The seller gave the seller's agent a bottle of wine. And under the old method, the seller's agent is going to pour a little, some, or a lot of that wine into the buyer's agent's glass. But under the new method, the seller's agent and the buyer's agent each have their own glass. They may not be the same size. They may not be equal. They may have different amounts of wine in them, but they are independent of one another. <clears throat> so I mentioned the MLS is not going to be used to offer compensation. So in that situation, how can the seller's agent and the buyer's agent agree on what that compensation is going to be? So CAR revised, it's Cooperating Broker Compensation Agreement, that's form CBC. You see that on your screen, and it is a much simplified form now, or it will be in June, than it is currently. Why is it simplified? Well, there's no ML, there will be no MLS offer of compensation, so we're able to get rid of the paragraphs confirming the MLS or modifying or changing the MLS two paragraphs gone. Since there's no offer of compensation through the MLS, it does not matter <clears throat> if the listing agent and the selling agent are both members of the MLS. It does not matter if the property is listed with the MLS. Great, so we were able to get rid of four other paragraphs. Because we anticipate that the use of the CBC form going forward may be in a very tight period right? A small period of time. This all might happen right around the time that an offer is being made, that hopefully an offer is being accepted. Because of that, we did not want the agent's agreement under the old CBC. It required a broker or manager consent. Well, if you're dealing with a short period of time to try to get an offer accepted, we do not want the agents or brokers involvement to interfere with the buyer and seller's ability to contract. So we removed the management approval language in the old CBC form. But I want to point out something that is new to the June version of the CBC form. And you could look at paragraph you're going to look at paragraph three, the offer of compensation. <clears throat> Notice it says in the second paragraph, after you've defined the amount of cooperation, the agreement is contingent upon buyer and seller entering into a purchase agreement and buyer's broker being confirmed as the agent of buyer. How is that going to happen in the purchase agreement? Well, there is an agency confirmation paragraph in the purchase agreement. And there is a broker paragraph on the last page of the purchase agreement. So that's where you will find that the buyer's agent should be named in both of those paragraphs. And in order for this compensation obligation to become binding, there needs to be a closing of that transaction, right? So there are conditions to or limitations to the effectiveness of the CBC or the binding nature of the CBC as between the buyer's agent and the seller's agent. Now I'm going to have you look at paragraph five because you always have the ability to add additional terms. 
that might be beneficial to you as an individual licensee or that might be required or recommended by your brokerage company. What we are hearing from the field is that there are going to be different ways that the CBC might be brought into a transaction. It could be that a buyer's agent contacts a seller's agent, asks what is being offered, or says this is what the buyer's agent is willing to accept, and then a CBC is generated at that point in time. But it could be that if the listing agreement has authorized a specific amount to be used as cooperation from listing agent to selling agent, that some licensees may say, you know what, we are willing to put a CBC out there early, signed by the listing side that identified that amount. Maybe it goes out with a disclosure package, for example, that buyers and their agents might access before even viewing a property, okay? Well, if something like that happens, do you think that the listing agent would want to have a buyer's agent to sign that at any point in time, even after an agreement has been entered into when there may have been other elements that affected compensation? And the answer to that question really is probably no. And so if one is in that situation, if they're using the CBC in that way, Notice there's an optional checkbox in paragraph five. If this CBC is offered by the seller's broker, so in other words, they're the ones who initiate the CBC, it is only valid if it is signed and returned prior to or with the buyer's offer, right? So that would prevent a situation where you have an agreement, maybe the seller agreed to pay some of the buyer's agent's compensation, and then later, the buyer's agent brings in a signed CBC. That would not be good for anybody. In the pre-settlement, the CBC form, we found it was rarely used in transactions because most people just relied on the MLS for compensation. Under the new regime, so to speak, we think that the CBC form will almost always be needed certainly when there's a situation where the listing broker is offering to cooperate with the buyer's broker. So we said no MLS. There's another way to document that cooperation agreement. It's using form CBC. Excuse me. Oh, here we go. Okay. All right, so let's change our slide now. Trying to change my slide. There we go. So we talked about paragraph 2C1, seller side compensation, 2C2, optional buyer cooperation in a listing agreement. But let's talk about other ways that compensation might be addressed in the listing agreement. So now we're back to the listing agreement. What if you have a situation where a buyer comes in and the buyer is unrepresented? Maybe the buyer thinks they're gonna get a better deal. Maybe the buyer is a arrogant lawyer who thinks they know best and don't and doesn't need anybody's help in a transaction. And so the buyer is truly unrepresented, not a dual agency situation. The buyer is actually unrepresented. Now the listing agent has a situation where they're the only licensee involved in the transaction. There might be extra work that they are going to need to do because the buyer is unrepresented, because there's not somebody else that they can rely on for communication with the buyer. And in that situation, it's possible that the listing agent says, you know what, seller, if that happens, I'm happy to sell your property, but I kind of want my milk and I want some cookies too because it's gonna mean extra work for me in the transaction. So if that situation would apply to you at the time you're taking the listing, the box would be checked in paragraph 2C3, a dollar amount would be filled in there, and that would be in addition to whatever was agreed to in paragraph 2C1. All right, so we have another paragraph here, and it's 2C4. And 2C4 is a situation where the 
agent, an individual licensee, an individual agent is representing both buyer and seller in the transaction, right? So there is not an unrepresented principal. The principal is represented by the same licensee. So licensees are busy people. You may have a listing with seller one. You may have a buyer representation agreement with buyer two. If cooperation was authorized in paragraph 2C2, the seller would owe the amount under 2C1 to the seller side, and the seller would also owe the amount under 2C2 to the buyer side. It just could happen to be the same individual licensee that is representing both the seller and the buyer. In that situation, we know there is the possibility that that same individual agent may be willing to engage in a negotiation with the seller, may be willing to, if they're the only agent involved, work for less than the total amount of the combined C1 and C2. If that's the case, then the OR box should be checked in the right column of 2C4, and maybe a different percentage or a different dollar amount is placed in there. And to go back to my milk analogy, you know, it could be that there is that there is you know different right there's different size containers for milk right we don't know one for a seller side and one for the buyer side but if we have the same individual licensee representing both maybe what you decide on is we're just going to have one container with a different amount of milk right i'm using milk per dollar in our situation Okay, so let's move on down. So we've covered paragraph 2C in the residential listing agreement. What about 2D? 2D is kind of an odd duck. So I'm using my duck, I'm using a duck analogy here. 2D talks about optional seller concessions. Under the NAR settlement terms, a seller is allowed to offer concessions or indicate that the seller is willing to consider offers that have the buyer saying to the seller, seller, I want you to make concessions. Now, very important to understand here, the terms of the NAR settlement. Remember we said under the terms of the NAR settlement, no offer of compensation can be made through the MLS. As part of the explanation as to what that means, you cannot use an MLS substitute to offer compensation. But the settlement does allow a term for the seller to say, I will consider concessions. But very important to note, and so we see the reference paragraph in 2D, references paragraph five of the RLA, that the concessions must not specify that they are to be used for broker compensation. You cannot use a concession field as a substitute for an MLS cooperation field that is going away. Concessions must be allowed to be used for any permissible expense or cost, okay? So how will you know if the concession field is being used as a disguised way to treat cooperation offers? Well, you know, if it looks like a duck, and quacks like a duck and waddles like a duck. It probably is a duck. You're not gonna know that for sure. To me, the most important part at the time of the listing is we look up there at the top of the screen, paragraph 2D. And if you look at the right side, it says seller is willing to consider offers asking for concessions. Not that the seller is agreeing at the time of the listing, but the seller is saying, you know what? If you want to make an offer buyer and your offer requires me to make concessions to you, I'm willing to consider those, but it is not a promise to agree to those concessions. It's just saying, I am willing to look at offers that have concessions in them. <clears throat> so what are concessions? Well, a good example of concessions on your screen now are snips from the residential purchase agreement. 
And in the residential purchase agreement, paragraph 3G1, and it has been this way for a long time in California, a buyer can ask the seller to credit the buyer for closing cost or for other amounts. That's paragraph 3G1. That would essentially be a seller concession. Seller is agreeing, seller is conceding to pay something that the buyer is otherwise obligated to pay. But also in paragraph 3G of the residential purchase agreement is 3G3. And this is not new. This is already in the residential purchase agreement. There's an optional paragraph there that the buyer can ask the seller to pay the buyer's obligation to compensate the buyer's broker, right? So the buyer is saying to the seller, you know, I could ask you to pay for closing costs or certain other concession amounts. I can also ask you to pay through the purchase agreement. This is not being done through the MLS. This is being done through the purchase agreement. The buyer can ask the seller to pay the buyer's obligation to pay the buyer's broker, right? So it's really essentially the same thing, right? Buyer has an obligation to do something or to pay for something. And the buyer is saying, seller, I would like you to take on that responsibility. If that happens, if that box is checked and you're using zip form or whatever your provider is, the seller payment to buyer's broker form will come in. This form is being revised for the June 2024 release. And it's really being simplified. And it's being simplified. If you look down to paragraph one of the form SPBB, the biggest part of your screen. And it talks about what's the amount. So the old SPBB has three different paragraphs dealing with amounts. And you've got to you know, add or subtract to figure out what the dollar amount is. No longer the new SPBB form says, seller, you're agreeing to pay a certain amount to satisfy the buyer's obligation, either some of it or all of it, okay? There's gonna be a maximum amount that the seller owes. It's not gonna be any more than what the buyer already owes after first subtracting any amount that the buyer's agent receives from the seller's agent. How are you gonna know what that is? Well, that's paragraph C, or excuse me, that's form CBC that we just talked about, okay? So remember, we went back to the broker compensation advisory form. I talked about there's different ways the buyer's agent can get paid, right? From the buyer directly, from the seller directly, which would be form SPBB and or from the seller's agent to the buyer's agent. That would be through a CBC form or some combination of the three. Well, so we're moving on down. We're back to the residential listing agreement now. We've made our way through 2A through D. What about paragraph 2E? There's really nothing new here. It's just been moved into the grid. What items are included? What items are excluded? What are leased items? Are there propane tanks or water softeners or alarm systems, right? What are the smart home features? Again, all information that is already in the residential listing agreement. Again, if you want to know some more of the substance, remember to look at the substantive paragraphs, which you can see all of those related to 2E are all going to be found in paragraph six of the residential listing agreement. So let's move on down. We're getting to the end of our grid. We've got all sorts of terms dealing with the MLS. What MLS will the property be listed in, right? You don't have to list in the MLS. If you do list in the MLS, there will not be an offer of compensation once those changes are implemented no later than August 17th. But don't you think a seller might wanna know for marketing purposes, how the property is going to be marketed, what MLS is going to be used. There's a lot of information coming soon on coming soon status. That might be relevant to a seller. These are items that require negotiation. 
or require agreement or require a term to be filled in, agreement or not, agreement, right? Is there going to be public marketing? Um, is the property going to be kept off the MLS? These are all items because they require something to be filled in, were moved from the substantive clauses to the grid early on. What about the brokers and the sellers? Duties, well, when our offer is going to be presented, how are you going to deal with supplemental offer letters? Notice the initial item there, the default in paragraph, we're talking about 2G2. Seller instructs broker not to present buyer letters. Um, there may be a way to do that. You can opt into that. What about the investigation reports that the seller is going to agree to pay for? Well, we know by default, we're including the natural hazard disclosure. We list a lot of the other ones there for you. Again, all of these items, nothing new here. When you get down to, we leave the grid, we go to paragraph three, the advisories and addenda we already talked about. The broker compensation advisory is bundled with the listing agreement. But if any of those other specialty things apply to your transaction, maybe there's a trust seller, maybe there's an REO seller, you know, we hope we don't return to the days of short sales, but those kinds of things would need to be checked. So we're moving on now. Now we're talking about the substantive paragraphs, compensation to broker. Oh, guess what? We already talked about a lot of these things, right? The compensation to broker. And so you can go back and look at slides five, eight, nine, and 10. You know, is there going to be an offer to compensate buyers, brokers, and the like? We talked about those things already. <clears throat> um, what, what else do I want to mention here? Um, really, there's nothing new here, right? The compensation terms, when does compensation apply? Is there going to be a protection period? There is a protection period. I'm going to go back and show you where that is. Hopefully, I can find it relatively shortly. There we go. It's paragraph 2C6, continuation of right to compensate, to compensation for a broker, right? It would apply for so many days after the listing period. That blank line and the right column of 2C6 needs to be filled out or you as a listing broker do not have a protection period or a safety clause. There's multiple names for that type of agreement. So we're already here, nothing new to see. We talked about seller concessions. So here's just where the substantive term applies, but we've already covered that. And if you wanna go back, you can go back and see slide 11, where we talked about that. Uh, what about what's included and excluded? Well, we know the items themselves are gonna be as part of the grid, but here we get our substantive terms. What is an MLS? Client might wanna know what an MLS is, but nothing new there either. Wow, we're moving along, we're on to another page. Nothing new here. Are there benefits to using an MLS? Yes, even though there's no longer going to be compensation offered, there's still benefits to an MLS, how you public market, everything that you see on the slide right now, nothing new, so I don't wanna to take too much of our time. We're moving along, we go to the other page. Great, nothing new here. Same thing, we're dealing with agency disclosure. That's gonna be addressed. We know we have the agency disclosure form that's going to be bundled with the RLA, and it's going to be the first form with the RLA. We know that bundled after the RLA is going to be the possible representation of more than one buyer and seller. What about unrepresented buyers? We talked about how that would work from a compensation level. If you have, truly have an unrepresented buyer and the listing broker says, I want my milk and I want some cookies too because of the extra effort that's going to be involved, that's fine. The paragraph here, paragraph 9D, 9D, says that you as a listing agent are authorized to get a buyer non-agency form if that buyer truly does not want to be represented 
you as a listing agent do not want to have an inadvertent agency created with a buyer and have an inadvertent dual agency situation. So when you have a scenario where the buyer truly does not want to be represented, there will not be a dual agency. It really is incumbent upon you as a listing agent. Make sure you get a that buyer to sign a buyer non-agency agreement. That form is referenced on your slide right there. <clears throat> well, nothing new here either, right? I told you a lot of the listing agreement is staying exactly the same about, about, about security measures, about photographs, about key safes. Since there's going to be some choices, some of those clauses have been moved to the grid. Same issue, mediation first. If there's going to be an arbitration agreement between the seller and the listing agent, you would have to attach a separate form, form ARB. But again, nothing new here. On our signature page, nothing new here except one change that really is not unique to listing agreements. But we had members tell us that sometimes corporate names are very long and they would not fit into the allotted spot. So we added the ability to put a corporate name into paragraph for entity sellers into the paragraph five, not just long trust names um, or probate estate names. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna go through a few scenarios with you and then I'm gonna end my prepared remarks and take questions that have been building up out of the corner of my eye. I have seen a lot going through in the Q&A tab. So, so I'm going to allow, uh, say, at least a half an hour to address those questions. But let's go through some what ifs. What if you already have a listing? Not the new listing, not the June 24 listing, but you already have a listing. It has not expired and the property has not yet sold before these changes come into effect. What should you do? Well, CAR created a form for that, the DMLA, Disclosure and Modifications of the Listing Agreement. It informs the seller that changes are being made to the MLS, that no longer will compensation be allowed to be made through the MLS, and that our listing agreement needs to be modified as a result of that, once those changes are implemented, you as a listing agent agree that you will notify the seller when those changes are in fact implemented. Now, once that happens, you are still authorized to cooperate. You just cannot cooperate through the MLS. You may think about at that time, replacing your old listing agreement with a new listing agreement, but at a bare minimum, you're going to want to use form DMLA before the implementation takes effect, either on August 17th or possibly earlier through your MLS. All right, let's say you have a new listing agreement or you have an old one and it's about to expire and you need to extend it or you need to modify it. What should you do? Well, CIR has a form for that or will have one starting in June, the modification of terms for listing agreement. <clears throat> Previously, we had a modification of terms that could have been used for multiple purposes. We're creating one just for the listing agreement. Notice, what are the common things that get changed in listing agreements? Price of the property gets changed expiration dates get changed. The amount of compensation potentially gets changed, right? So we have pre-printed clauses for that. <clears throat> can write in anything else under the other paragraph. Notice because the listing agreement <clears throat> allows the broker or office manager to disapprove within five days, there is that same right for a modification of terms. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about a situation that probably is on a lot of your minds. Uh, we know a lot of people are concerned about this. What if a potential buyer shows up 
at an open house, right? That's what you're hoping for. You have an open house. You're the listing agent. You hope buyers come into the open house. <clears throat> we, I already talked about the situation where the terms of the settlement require you to have an agreement if you are working with the buyer prior to showing a buyer a property or giving a buyer a tour. So does that mean that if a buyer shows up at an open house, you must have an agreement with the buyer? Well, the answer is it depends on whether you are working with the buyer. So how do you know if you're working with a buyer? Well, it really depends on what is happening at the open house. What kind of communication is going on between the listing agent and the buyer at the open house? A good way to protect yourself is to use this new form, OHNASI, Open House Visitor Non-Agency Disclosure and Sign-In. So if you can get the buyer to sign this agreement, the buyer says, I acknowledge that you, agent who's holding the open house, you are not representing me. You are not representing me. You are not working with me. You are solely doing this on the seller's behalf. Therefore, I don't need to have, or you as a listing agent, don't need to have a separate agreement signed with that buyer prior to showing the buyer the property at an open house or giving the buyer a tour because the buyer is saying, you are representing the seller only. That's wonderful. This form is really good. The form also lets the buyer know, it's the last substantive paragraph, that buyer, if you want representation, I'm willing to sign a representation agreement with you. So the best practice really is to ask all buyers to sign. What if a buyer, a visitor, I should say, to an open house will not sign? What are you going to do with that visitor? Well, I don't know. You know, we want to be sarcastic. Maybe you're going to use the old trap door approach to that visitor. Maybe. You'll force the visitor out of the property, but that's not something that we recommend that you do, either either of those choices, right? So if the visitor will not sign this open house form, we say, let him view the property, right? You're not going to be the bouncer at the front door. You're not going to be keeping people out. You're not going to be forcing people out. If the visitor will not sign, the open house non-agency form. Let them view the property. But once they start viewing the property, you've got to be very careful if they start asking you questions, if they start engaging you in a discussion about the property, because it is licensed activity to have a substantive discussion with a visitor about this property, about their needs, about other properties. Once you do that, you may inadvertently be creating an agency with that visitor. And once you've created an agency with that visitor, you are no longer just representing the seller. You are now working with that buyer, which means that you would need a representation agreement. Now, it could be that through the course of the discussion, the visitor is interested in the property. You're having the discussion. You let them know, you think, you know what, I might be crossing the line. I might be going over into representation. So maybe I want to bring out another document to the attention of the visitor. And it's a form we call it limited property representation agreement, representation broker compensation agreement. You identify the open house property right at the top. Paragraph 1A is for visitors attending the open house who do not already have representation. And this form is sort of like a, a, a the, the baby brother or the baby sister version of the buyer representation and broker compensation agreement. It's not exclusive only. If only paragraph 1A applies, it only applies to the open house property. And if you look at paragraph 2A, the maximum representation period is only 30 days. It might be less than that, right? So, but if you're starting to have a discussion with the buyer, you think you're crossing the line into possible representation, then you're going to want to have the buyer sign something with you. The limited property, as I say, is limited to if it's 1A, which is the default to just the open house property. 
if you're having this discussion with the buyer and you think there's a couple of other properties that the buyer might be interested in seeing or touring with you, either in person or virtually, then you're going to want to check 1B and you could list up to two additional properties there. So again, the limited property form, it could be for this property only, but a maximum of three. It's a non-exclusive representation, no longer than 30 days. So we are giving you options other than just saying, sign the open house non-agency or get out or have no discussions with that buyer. There is something that you could do short of having the full-blown buyer representation and broker compensation agreement. All right, real quickly, because I see we're at 11 o'clock. If you like this webinar, again, join us next week where we're going to talk about the remainder of the forms that are being released in June. One of those forms is the residential purchase agreement. You probably want to be aware of that. There's a seller property questionnaire. There's a dozen more. Again, think about that July legal, web, legal live webinar. Really a completely different take. Um, we've got our two superstar attorneys, Olivia Van and Jana Gardner. They're going to give you tips about how to avoid being mistreated by others. And now it's your turn. Jana, what do you have for me? We have a lot of questions for you today, <laughs> Neil. Uh, quite a few questions came in. Uh, you covered so much, um, but there's, there's a lot of things that came up. So let's go ahead and jump in. Um, I, I think maybe the first place to start, there were a lot of questions about the CBC form and when to use it and how to use it, et cetera. Um, and one of the main questions, well, I guess was basically when and how to use it. A lot of people were wondering if they could upload it directly to the MLS or reference it in the MLS. Um, and I think there was maybe some confusion about what can be said on the MLS and what can't be. Okay. Well, great questions. What we are hearing from the field is that there's going to be, there's different methodologies as to how that CBC form is going to be used. I'll talk about some of those in just a minute, but I want to start with having a link to the CBC and the MLS. I would be very cautious about doing so. Remember, you cannot advertise cooperating compensation through the MLS. The MLS cooperation field is being removed, but you cannot replace that with a substitute, okay? So if you have a direct link from the MLS to the CBC, I am worried that that might be considered as a substitute MLS offer of compensation or offer of cooperation. So mm -hmm. I'm a little bit concerned about doing that way. How would one know? How would a buyer's agent know? Or how would a listing agent be able to convey to a buyer's agent what compensation is being offered, right? Because mm -hmm. if there was approval in the listing agreement, there needs to be a way to communicate what that compensation offer is going to be. There's a few things that we know for sure that you could do right now. If we get more clarification from NAR, we will of course let you know when we get that clarification. But at the very least we know an agent can include an offer of compensation on an agent's website. That is not deemed an MLS substitute. Okay. An agent might put that into some kind of marketing or flyer or advertisement. An agent can talk to, a listing agent can talk to a buyer's agent. You can have a conversation over the phone. There can be a conversation through email or a conversation via text message where it is conveyed, right? How the CBC actually gets becomes part of the transaction is something that we're finding that different brokers may be approaching it differently. Some brokers may say, we want the buyer's agent to instigate the CBC and send it to the listing agent to be completed and signed. As I mentioned, we are also hearing from the field that some brokers are saying, if we already know through the listing agreement what offer has been authorized by the seller, 
then we're willing to put a signed CBC out there through some mechanism other than the MLS so that buyers agents are aware of it, okay? We don't know what's gonna happen in the field. One of the many things that has been established as a purpose of the NAR settlement is that there be options and that there be no one way of doing business. There's options regarding establishing compensation. There needs to be options regarding establishing cooperating broker compensation as well. Next, Jana, if you think Great. that was sufficient. Thank you. Yeah, that, that clarified a lot. And it kind of leads into my next question here um, that I think we really want to get straight, which is there was a lot of confusion. So let's say you figure the CBC process out. You talk to the other agent, you guys enter enter into that agreement. Do you still need to use 3G3 and the SPBB in the purchase agreement? Or, or do you not use that because you've already handled this situation separately on the CBC? Okay, yeah, great question. So the answer here is like so many legal answers. It depends, right? It depends on what the buyer agreed to pay their broker and what the listing agent agreed to pay the buyer's broker. So again, we're assuming for your situation that a CBC has been entered into between the listing broker and the buyer's broker, identifying a percentage or amount. If that percentage or amount fully meets the obligation of the buyer to pay their own broker pursuant to the buyer broker agreement, which we call a buyer representation and broker compensation agreement, if the buyer's obligation has been fully satisfied through the CBC, then there is no reason to complicate the purchase transaction by use of 3G3 or the SPBB form. Why? Because there will be nothing that a seller will be required to pay to the buyer's agent. It has already been satisfied through the listing agent's offer of cooperation. Now, maybe the buyer agreed to pay their agent X and the listing agent agreed to pay the buyer's agent something less than X. So now we have a differential. The buyer still owes that differential. The buyer will then have a discussion with the buyer's agent of, should we ask the seller to pay that differential or should the buyer just pay the differential on the buyer's own? And there will be a lot of things to consider as part of that discussion. Does the price need to be raised if we're going to ask the seller? Will it put the buyer's offer at a competitive disadvantage if we ask the seller to pay that differential? Will the seller be offended by asking for this when the buyer's agent has already received compensation through the listing agent, right? Does the buyer have the funds to pay that differential to their agent? So all of those factors need to be considered. The issue is, was the buyer's obligation fully satisfied through the CBC? If yes, no reason to use 3G3 in the purchase agreement. If the buyer's obligation has not been fully satisfied, then the buyer and their own agent need to have a discussion about what to do. Back to you, Jen. All right. And I, I just want to clarify one thing because I, I keep seeing this come up and I, I think I see where the confusion is coming from. There, people were asking about, you know, can you and can you include the CBC, you know, when you send over disclosures to the the buyer side? And I think our answer to that in general is, well, well, sure, you you could send over a CBC with the with the disclosures. But when the follow up question is, and I put a link to that disclosure package in the MLS, that's maybe where the the difference is coming in is sort of what is linked to. And I'm just I've been making that comment really because I keep seeing it coming up in the the Q and A, which is, you know. The, we're drawing a distinction between what is uploaded or linked to directly out of the MLS versus what is sent directly to a buyer or a buyer's agent. And I just want to make sure people are, are following along with that. Okay. So Jenna, I, I think that's a great question. And I think it, I think it's a difficult question. Jenna, if you have an easy answer, you'll, you'll fill in after I respond. So to me, you don't want to have anything that flows from the MLS that addresses compensation. I think that is potentially problematic. Mm -hmm. It is okay to have a disclosure package indicated through the MLS because a disclosure package in and of itself 
is not a compensation issue. When a compensation form is brought into that disclosure package that is automatically addressed through the MLS, to me, that is a, a potentially problematic issue. Okay, mm -hmm. so Janet, please tell me if you feel differently about. Yeah, that. no, I, I I completely agree. Um, and then you know, of course, we always give the caveat that the MLSs are going to be making these rules. They're going to be outlining what is and isn't okay. They're going to be having their own fields. And so, you know, we always uh, recommend people reach out to their MLSs, see if their MLSs are doing any training. Um, but I I completely agree with what you said as a general best practice. Okay, and I'm going to add one other item to that. So maybe there is some kind of automatic feed that happens through your MLS, right? As a listing broker, if I want to get the CBC form into the hands of the buyer in that situation, I would have to do that in addition to whatever disclosure package gets sent out. Yep. I could do that on my own. I could do that at you know the same time. I'm not an expert as to how those things automatically get generated. Uh -huh. But it would have to come from the listing agent independently and not something that happens automatically through the MLS. Great. Yeah, I, to I totally agree. Okay. I think we covered that. Um, somewhat related, uh, can you just clarify a little bit, a lot of confusion about the difference between the uh, seller authorizing the agent to offer compensation? Well, you know, so talking basically about paragraph 2C2 versus the seller um, authorizing the agent to advertise concessions, 2D. So can you, can you just remind people of the difference between 2C2 additional offer of compensation versus 2D authorizing uh, offers of concessions? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so if the seller authorizes the listing broker to cooperate with a buyer's broker. <clears throat> what the seller is saying in paragraph 2C is listing broker, if you do this, I am agreeing to pay you that additional amount, right? There's the amount that the seller says they're going to pay their own broker under 2C1. If the seller authorizes the listing broker to cooperate, the seller is making a promise. The seller is agreeing to pay that additional amount if in fact, the listing broker cooperates with the buyer's broker. 2D is not an agreement. 2D is really saying, I'm inviting offers to come in asking for concessions, but I'm not making any promise right now. I'm not promising I'm going to agree to the concessions. I'm certainly not telling you what the con you the buyer what the concessions can be used for. I'm just saying bring it on. Bring your offers. I'm willing to listen to them, but I have not made an affirmative contractual obligation to agree to those concessions. And I think that's the difference. Great. Yeah, I think that was very helpful. And I think just to confirm one important thing you said there, because there was some confusion about this too, the the seller is saying they're willing to entertain making concessions. And once they agree to make those that concession, it's going to be up to the buyer how it's applied, to what cost, whether it's for traditional closing costs, whether it's their obligation to compensate their agent, that's putting it in the buyer's court at that point, right? Uh, that And that's true. And then you, you mentioned something. Once the seller agrees, how will the seller agree? The seller agree if the buyer asks for concessions in the purchase agreement mm -hmm. and the seller signs that purchase agreement. Remember, the seller does not have to sign that purchase agreement if the seller changed their mind about concessions or if the seller realized that given the purchase price that's, that is offered, the seller is not willing to agree to the amount of concessions that the buyer has asked for, right? Mm -hmm. So there's no obligation. At the time of the listing, there is no obligation. Got it. All right. And then quite a few questions about sort of the different agency situations that might arise, you know, dual agency in an office versus dual agency, a single agent. And then a lot of questions about unrepresented buyers. So can you just sort of 
you know, I suppose very briefly explain what the difference is between those three. When we talk about those three different things, what that's going to look like in the transaction, an office dual versus a single agent dual versus an unrepresented buyer. Yep, absolutely. Just writing some notes here. <clears throat> I'm going to start with unrepresented buyers. <clears throat> I am just taking a guess here that, and, and I could be completely wrong, okay? But I'm thinking that is more likely to be a rarity than something that is commonplace. <clears throat> if a licensee has been working with a buyer, <clears throat> And that licensee makes an offer for through it for that buyer on a property, that buyer is going to be represented, right? <clears throat> if a buyer comes in without a licensee, the buyer has not been working with a real estate agent, goes directly, for example, to the listing broker. I recognize that that is a possibility in the situation, that is a possibility in the marketplace. In that situation, the listing broker would have a conversation with the buyer that I can represent you if I represent you in writing this offer, okay? I am going to need to have a representation agreement with you, right? Especially if I am showing you the property. The buyer may say, I am not interested. Let me sign that open house, not agency form. I have no interest in working with you. The buyer may then write an offer on their own. Good for that buyer and being able to do so. That would truly be an unrepresented buyer. The listing licensee, would be the only licensee in the transaction. The brokerage company would be a single agent in the transaction. The brokerage company should give that buyer a buyer non-agency form. If you have a licensee who has a listing on property, I'm going to call that licensee, licensee A. That licensee A may be working with the seller. Licensee A may also have a representation agreement because licensees are busy people and they quite often work with more than one principal at the same time. So let's say licensee A is working with buyer number one. Buyer number one says, I'm interested in the property that you happen to have listed. All right. That licensee will be a dual agent. The brokerage company for that licensee will be a dual agent in that transaction, okay? In that situation, licensee A may say to the seller, if I'm the only licensee involved, it's all true, everything is through my brokerage company, I would be entitled to compensation from you, seller, under paragraph 2C1, I would also be entitled to compensation from you, seller, under 2C2, because I am representing the buyer in that transaction. I, as an individual, am also a dual agent. Now, those of you who know dual agency actually flows from the brokerage down to the licensee rather than the other way around. But that licensee A may say to the seller, if this situation comes up, I don't know if it will come up, but if it does come up, I want to be compensated through, for my actions in 2C1 and for my actions in 2C2, or I may essentially give you a, a break, seller. That's a possibility, okay? I want to talk about another scenario. Licensee A works for brokerage company one. Licensee B also works for brokerage company one. Licensee B has an agreement with the buyer. That buyer through licensee B <clears throat> views the property and writes an offer on the property. <clears throat> the brokerage company is a dual agent. 
the brokerage company is entitled to compensation under 2C1, and the brokerage company is entitled to compensation under 2C2. In that situation, you happen to have two different licensees that are initially working with the different principles in the transaction. The brokerage company is a dual agent. Through the brokerage company, each licensee is a dual agent, but you have more than one licensee involved in the transaction. Therefore, you do not have a situation where you have a single licensee agent involved. And so, you know, that that possible uh, break, that possible discount that some individual licensees may agree to would not apply in that situation because you have different licensees, even though they are with the same company, even though they are both dual agents through their broker dual agency, that third paragraph would not apply. Um, does that help, Jenna? Yes, that helps quite a bit. And just, okay. just two very, very quick clarifications. So just to confirm, because this came up too. So if you're a listing agent and a buyer calls you up and says, you know, I would, I would like to see the property. Um, I'd like you to show me the property and I, I'd like you to write an offer for me. You know, you're going to be a dual agent. That listing agent does need to get a buyer representation agreement with that client, right? In some form, if they're, whether it's the limited property or the BRBC, if they are going to show the buyer the property and ultimately write an offer for them, then the buyer representation agreement's in play. I'm going to modify that just slightly, Jenna. Okay. I think that is the preferred course of action to take. I think that's the best risk management action to take. I, I believe possibly legally for that buyer who comes in without their own agent, you could have that buyer sign a buyer non-agency agreement. Therefore, the listing licensee could say, I'm only representing the seller here. Okay. Anything you say to me, nothing is confidential. Everything I do, I'm going to be doing on behalf of the seller. Now, theoretically, if all that licensee did was talk to the buyer and says, I want you to fill out the RPA this way. You know, here's the dollar amount. Here's the deposit amount. Here's whether I want liquidated damages. Here's whether I want arbitration. And the buyer dictated all of the terms that would be put into the list into the offer agreement, then theoretically, that listing agent could still say, I am only representing the seller. I am doing this on the seller's behalf. But the minute that licensee has any discussion with the buyer about whether it would be appropriate or applicable to have certain terms filled out in a certain way, then that licensee really can be considered to be acting as an agent for that buyer and would wind up being a dual agent. And that's why the best practice is to avoid that situation, to avoid, to avoid inadvertent or implied agency. Mm -hmm. It would be best in that situation to have something like the limited property buyer representation agreement. Great. And then just one clarification to the clarification. Uh, can, <laughs> can sellers decline to work with an unrepresented buyer? Can a seller say, I don't want to accept this offer or negotiate with this buyer because I'm not comfortable with an unrepresented buyer? Sellers have the absolute right to do so. A seller can do so at the time an offer is presented. The seller could say, I do not want to accept this offer because the buyer is unrepresented. I know there are advantages to having agents in a transaction. Agents are able to smooth over problems in a transaction, right? So there are advantages to each side having their own agent in the transaction or dual agent, doesn't matter. There are advantages to doing that. I, as a seller, can make that decision. A seller could make that decision that could be written in to the listing agreement saying, you know, in other terms, telling the seller's agent, the listing agent, I do not want to accept offers from buyers who are unrepresented. So that's a possibility there as well. My view is probably better to wait and for an offer to come in from an unrepresented buyer 
before making that decision, but it could be done either way. Great. Thank you. All right. So we're doing great. Just a couple more questions in our last few minutes here. Uh, okay. Question about when to or when an agent needs to modify their existing listing agreement. So if you have a listing agreement that's in place right now, or you're signing one in the next two or so weeks, um, mm -hmm. and then you know the the new form comes out, the new rule changes go into effect. One, when would you recommend that they use that the DMLA form, the disclosure and modification form? And two, does it matter if the property is already under contract or in escrow? or not, whether that affects their need to modify? Okay, great, great question. So I think the DMLA can be used at any time. You do not have to wait until the last day before the MLS rules change, change or August 17th rolls around. You could use the DMLA right now because what it says is, I licensee am gonna tell you seller when these rules change and the GMA, DMLA already lets you know that there will be no offer of compensation through the MLS once that happens and that I, as a seller, am agreeing that the offer of compensation would have to be made through some other means. So it could be done immediately. You know, you may not want to, you know, instill additional paperwork that may be unnecessary. I can understand that. If a transaction has already been entered into but not closed, do you need the DMLA? And I guess if you're really confident that that transaction is going to close, you don't need to modify your agreement. The rule that was in the place when the transaction was, was entered into will apply to that transaction, not a subsequent rule that comes into effect after your transaction has already been signed and executed by the parties. Something that you need to consider though, as a listing agent, which is transactions fail. So you may think about that and say, yeah, um, you know, I, maybe I'll hold off on doing the DMLA until I find out what happens with that transaction. Or you could make the decision that, you know, I just like getting things out of the way right now. I've got a good relationship with my seller right now. And it's a good time to bring up something new with the seller right now. If I wait until a transaction fails, my seller is not going to be happy, right? That's not a good time to be bringing additional documents in and asking the seller to sign. So I might feel more comfortable doing it now, telling the seller, this is a just in case form. I'm doing my best to make sure this transaction closes, but just in case, I want you to be aware that circumstances will change if this transaction does not close. Great, Back very helpful. Um, and then I'm going to just I'm going to add one sort of tech reminder note. I saw someone ask if the you know will the forms be automatically updated in zip form, and mm -hmm. you know the answer is yes. On the day the new forms are released and the zip form, when you go to pull up the forms, they should be automatically updated. Someone asked, is that true even if I use templates? My understanding is yes. If you have a template, they'll be automatically updated in there. What you don't want to do is go back and copy an old transaction. <laughs> if you've used an old, if you don't have a template, but you just take an old transaction and copy those forms over, those won't be updated. So just remember that to make sure you're using the newest, most current versions of the forms. All right. Two more very quick questions and we can get out of here. Um, right. So Second to last one, does the listing agent have to disclose what the seller is willing to offer? There's a lot of questions about how can you advertise what the seller is willing to offer in terms of either buyer's agent's compensation or concessions and generally, but is the, is the listing agent actually obligated to advertise or disclose that upfront to a buyer or buyer's agent? I would say the answer to that is no, the listing agent is not required to advertise that amount. That is a discussion that the listing agent needs to have with the seller. So the seller has authorized an amount. One would ask the question, why would the listing agent not want to promote that amount? There might be a reason. I could think of one reason. Maybe 
the buyer's agent will come in and the buyer will ask for something less. If the listing agent pays less than what is authorized, then the seller is not obligated to pay that differential. So it might wind up with the seller not having to pay as much in the future. If, if the, but if the listing agent has been authorized, I would say at the very least, the listing agent would want to let it be known that, you know, again, through their website or some other marketing material, that the listing agent has been authorized to cooperate and maybe could say, call listing agent, something like that, if you do not want to identify the full amount initially. Right. And then final question, because I, I couldn't let you get out of here without uh, answering this one. Um, there were a lot of questions about open houses. I think we covered most of them already in talking about unrepresented buyers and dual agencies. But of course, there were some questions. What if you are holding an open house for another broker? You're, you're sitting in an open house and it's not your broker's listing. You're doing it to meet buyers, in fact. Uh, what, it, what are the risks there? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna modify that slightly, and then we'll, then we will end. So you could be holding an open house for a listing licensee. You might be in that same licensee's brokerage company, but you're not the one who obtained the listing. In which case, you are the same brokerage company. If a you may be doing that to meet buyers. If a buyer comes through, you're really going to be starting with the same approach. Buyer, right now, I'm not going to be able to communicate with you other than giving you pre-prepared information about the property. Okay, And I would like you, buyer, to sign the open house non-agency because the brokerage company that represents the seller is now representing you. Now, once you start engaging with this buyer, since you are a licensee from that same brokerage firm, once you start engaging, having a licensed discussions with that buyer, either about the open house property or about other wants and needs of the buyer, oh, now you are working with the buyer, right? And you're gonna need something like the limited property representation agreement, okay? Because you do not wanna have an inadvertent dual agency. We are aware that there are situations where the licensee holding the open house is not even in the same brokerage company as the listing licensee. In that case, there are some issues that you need to be concerned about that have nothing to do with what we've discussed today. So is the seller aware that another brokerage company is, in, is holding the open house? The licensee from another brokerage company would be representing another brokerage company. Is there an agreement between the open house agent and the listing licensee's brokerage company, between the two brokerage companies identifying their responsibilities, identifying how that would work in terms of the relationship? So those are issues that need to be considered irrespective of what we talked about today. But just going to the issue we talked about today, now, if you are a open house agent and you are not in the same brokerage company as the listing licensee, it may be very difficult for you to have the buyer sign that open house non-agency form. Why? Because you may not be representing the seller. Again, it sort of ties back to, is there some kind of an agreement between the two different brokerage companies. A lot of times there is no agreement, which means it's, it is going to be a, a, a legal gymnastics to say, to have the buyer sign something saying that the buyer is unrepresented when you as the open house agent do not represent the seller when you're holding that open house. So in that situation, it is even more incumbent upon you as the open house agent to at least get the buyer to sign a limited property representation agreement. Did that help, Jenna? Yeah, 
That helped quite a bit. I think that covers all the most frequently asked questions and we have uh, more than hit our time. So I think we can wrap it up. Okay, great. We're, well, I wanna thank everybody. Hopefully we will see some of you next week when we talk about the other new and revised forms from CAR. And we do have a lot of them that we need to cover and some very important ones, as I say, like some changes to the residential purchase agreement. Thank you for joining us. If you want a copy of this webinar today, you can go on to car.org slash risk management slash live. The presentation today, I thought I saw somewhere in the chat is gonna be posted by the end of the day. So that's really great news. And for those of you who missed the buyer representation class, that is also gonna be posted at that same site. Thank you very much and I hope everybody is able to, to succeed in the new environment that we are all going to be working in. Bye now.